Well, hello, church. How are we all doing? Did you enjoy the first part of Revelation? Well, in the first part of Revelation, then we looked at Jesus' overall program. And as we can have a quick look at the diagram where we kind of ended up, then we'll get started on today. We can see that Jesus has revealed that his overall program is to uh, get to the point where there's a new heaven and there's a new earth. And as the revelation unfolds to John, then he he gave John a revelation of what's going to be happening with the church of God and what's going to be happening in the world and how the second coming works and the millennial reign and then the final judgment uh, and then the new heaven and the new earth. He was talking in Revelation about the things that he saw before that, a marvelous revelation of Jesus in his glory And then all of the things that were and the letters to the seven churches, which is what we're going to be dealing with today. And then the things that come, which I pointed out from John's point of view, then it looked like the church was being raptured at that time and the church was in glory and came back with Christ uh, for his second coming as it appears in chapter 19 and verse 12 onwards. And so it's a great panorama that we've seen of the revelation program of Jesus Christ, how Jesus voiced to us his program and wanted to know and to be able to give us a blessing. The scriptures promise that there's a blessing for us who who read it. There's a blessing for us who study it. There's a blessing for us who teach it. But I'd like to start today looking at a a verse or series of verses in the early or middle, should I say, part of Revelation, uh, which gives us a bigger view. You know, from a human point of view, when we feel like we're the center of the universe and we feel like our problems are very big problems, and yet we can, when we understand the big story of what's happening, it's a, it helps us to understand our part in the bigger universe. So we pull it up in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 to 17, a vision of heaven and In the middle part of Revelation, there's quite a few scenes uh, where there's uh, seven scenes that are in heaven and seven scenes that are on earth. And this is one of the signs in heaven scenes that gives us a snapshot uh, from a heavenly view, a heavenly perspective of what's happening. And so from verse 1 of chapter 12, we read, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Hmm, I wonder who this woman could be. Have you any idea who the woman might represent? 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Oh, what drama, what, ex- what excitement, what, what a challenge, what a crisis is happening in the verses here. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and to his throne well I'm sure you can guess who this child is it's none other than Jesus the son of God who was caught up to God and is now seated on his throne at the right hand of God and so that tells us who the dragon is that the dragon is of course Satan and it also tells us who the woman is, who has the 12 stars, and she represents Israel, who brought forth Jesus of the tribe of Judah, who brought forth Jesus, who was the one who died and rose again and is seated at the right hand of God. So the scripture goes on from verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that she should feed her, he, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Oh, this is a bit of excitement. This is a bit of drama. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon 
and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. What a drama. What a, what a scene that Jesus has risen up into heaven and a great war breaks out. We already saw in the previous verses that Satan had come to earth and he'd, he'd taken a third of the stars with him. And we can understand from this that Satan had previously been cast to the earth as well. But he still had access to heaven for some reason. And here we see a war break out and it says there was found no place for them anymore. And so he was cast out. And he says, how powerful now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused him before our God day and night has been cast down. So it was a decisive thing that had happened that demonstrated the power of Christ and the power that has come to us in verse 11 to overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, even as they have done so. And we take it up in verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, Jesus. And what do you think has happened to the Hebrews throughout the last two millennia? What do you think has happened to the Jews who have been identified as the ones, the tribe that brought forth the Christ? Have they not been hunted from one end of the earth to the other? And this is why, because the dragon has got great wrath and he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child who rose up to heaven and led a war to have him cast out of heaven with a decisive defeat. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed out water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus." Well, hasn't that happened? That throughout history, wherever they have gone, the, the dragon has tried to consume the Jewish people. And yet they have survived and thrived. Even though there was a great holocaust, yet they have gathered back into the land of Israel and are prospering as it is this day. But also the dragon is angry and ready to make war with the rest of her offspring. I wonder who they might be. I wonder who they could be. Could it not be us who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ? And so we see that our trials and our tribulations, while they have been nothing compared to what the Jewish people have experienced then the rest of the people of the world even are yet to experience the wrath of the devil who lost what was his and has come down to vent his wrath and his rage. 
And it's so in the middle of this great story that we find ourselves. And if I've lost a letter, or if I've forgotten to press save on a document, and it feels like my world is falling apart, I only need to remember the story of Revelation and the great drama playing out through all of history. And we've seen just a little brief overview here in chapter 12 of Revelation and how that will eventually lead to this dragon, this devil, being cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And a new heaven and a new earth came, pristine and beautiful, where there would be no tears. What a story that we find ourselves in. And so I come to my task today, not so much to preach and to bring a storm of excitement, but to teach and bring a revelation, a progressive revelation of what Jesus is saying to the churches, what he voiced and said out loud so that we could know them. We are expressly, expressly told that there are letters to the seven churches. And I spoke about this last time. And we have them there on a diagram. And if you look out in the ocean there, you can see a little dot with the label Patmos. And so there, John is having this revelation. And on shore, many miles away, you can see these churches as they ex existed then in Turkey as it is now. Anatolia, it was called then. Turkey, it is called now. And I discussed some of the thoughts about these churches and whether the message to these churches was to them alone. And I put it forward that there were many more than seven churches in that day and that Jesus was not intentionally withholding his message, his hope, and his revelation of things to come from all of the church and giving it just to these seven churches. But rather, the scriptures say that we are to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, that he is using these seven churches as an example, that if the cap fits, then wear it. If the blessing is for you, then take it. If the revelation is a revelation to you, receive it. That these letters to the seven churches who each received a copy of the other letters and the, indeed the whole of this revelation preserved it as it is this day that we can obey this instruction to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Some indicate they will be here on earth when he comes. But they are not here. None of these churches exist in the flesh today. And he has not come. So the message of these churches still is alive today. We could also understand that it is part of a timeline if he has not yet come. Even though the actual churches do not exist, Jesus has not yet come. So while we all exist, the blessing is for all of us. Not only that, but some people, smarter than I, have identified that the passages are not just a prophetic message for those churches, but they are a prophetic message for all the churches as to things that are to come within the things that are. Well, if you're a little bit confused by what I just said then, then let me give you an illustration. I could say that you are living in your home. I could say that while you are living in your home, these things are going to happen. And then after these things, then you shall leave home and you shall do 
this and that. So it could be that these churches are a revelation about what is going to happen over the period of this current age. And this is how it can be presented. You can see across the top of this chart here the seven churches. Ephesians, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. And we can see the charge that was given to them that Ephesus was backsliding. Smyrna was being persecuted. Pergamon had immorality of some kind. I'll be touching on some of these things later. Jezebel was a key word for Thyatira. Dead, a key word for Sardis. Loving for Philadelphia and lukewarm for Laodicea. And we can understand that Ephesians, and I've aligned these churches in order, that Ephesians was a next generation church in the sense it was being first and in, in this order, as it's written here, represents the next generation after the apostles. And Smyrna being persecuted in the time of the Caesars. And the church becoming immoral in the sense of spiritual immorality like James talks about in his letter. That there's an immorality in the time of Constantine as the church becomes wedded to the state. And the Thyatira with the warning about Jezebel, that woman Jezebel that leads the people astray and I'll touch on this as well. With the introduction of Maryology and the veneration of Mary and with the great reformation then the church had a form of godliness in breaking away but it still was a very dead church in many ways until the time of the reformation began to lead into the evangelical age and the great missionary endeavors then the church was called the loving church and then with the outbreak of the holy spirit in the 1900s then the final church had the opportunity to be a, a red-hot church. And yet there can be a lukewarmness in the church without the Holy Spirit. And we'll touch on all of these things. So you can see there where each one of those churches is represented in an early church era up until the palpal era. era. And these boxes or columns are, are not to scale. Uh, the palpal era, era of uh, where Mariology reigned as a and the palpal system was wedded to, to power and was forced to be reckoned with through, throughout Europe and indeed uh, the world at that time was, a, was a, a good period of time. It was like, for argument's sake, roughly a third of the time and on each side of that, the three boxes each side of that are like another third of the time. So it's a big period of time referred to as the Dark Ages. You may have heard that term. And then from the time of Reformation, then the Reformed Church, as the church pro progressively began to reform itself. And so we can see how all of those uh, titles and uh, charges match the era in which those churches existed. And on the bottom row, you can see, uh, for your own study, you can see the approximate year where those, um, each stage, as it were, began. So that's a fantastic layout, a layered way to look. So let's now get into the passage of Scripture. And I'm not going to be looking at all of the churches, so breathe a sigh of relief there. Uh, not really. You can go and read it and enjoy it, and I'll, su I'll summarize it for you. But, of course, we haven't got time today to uh, read all of the Scriptures. So let's read Ephesians. And what I plan to do is uh, read the, the letter to the Ephesians, rather, in Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 and then to look at how that is structured for us so that we can begin to understand that each message to each church is structured in a similar way so that we can understand something from them. So let's take up from verse 1 of chapter 2. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says... He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. 
I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And this last verse where it says, he who has an ear. These may well be letters to the seven churches, but they are letters to you and I as well. He, not they, but he, as in you or I, that we have the opportunity to hear what he says to the churches and so learn from that, that we can take the blessing from that that he intends. So let's quickly look at uh, the layout here. So we have, it's obviously a revelation that he's bringing out. This is the book of Revelations. And so there's a revelation within each of these uh, passages to, in the letters to each of the churches. So there's a revelation in the name of the church. There's a revelation in the title given to Jesus in each case. And there's a revelation of Jesus' plan or his, his will or his desire for us. And there's a revelation of the problem and what to do about it if you have that kind of problem. And there's a warning of what might happen uh, if you don't correct the problem in some cases. And there's also the revelation of the blessing that he is holding out to us. And as we look at each one of these, then we can see something for the book of Ephesus or the church of Ephesus. That the church of Ephesus' name means purpose. That the church was a purposeful church. And yet it was losing its first love. It was losing its purpose. It was losing the things that it did at the first the purpose for which it existed. But look at the title of Jesus. He holds and he walks among us. He holds us. He walks among the lampstand. He holds the stars of the church. He hold, walks among us. He holds us and he's with us. He is the one. That's the title he gives himself. He is present and helping. He is present and working with us. And Jesus' plan that he reveals is that we are to be patient in work and in doctrine. Patient in continuing to do those first things and all things that he gives us to do. And patient in doctrine. Not patient with people that are wrong, but patient in remaining true. And if they found those false apostles as liars who were bringing in what, as we uh, read, was the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were actually spiritual descendants of a man called Nicholas. If you've read the book of Acts, then you come to the book of Acts. And in chapter 6, then there were seven guys that were the first deacons in the church. And one of them you would remember as Philip, the mighty, who became a mighty evangelist and ministered to the man uh, from Ethiopia. Great story. But Nicholas, not so much a good story. Then Nicholas developed a warped view of mercy and grace. And so he lived, lived what we call a hedonistic life, that he did whatever he felt like doing. And he lived a life of unrestrained indulgence and began to teach others. And so a sect 
begin to develop. And the scriptures of the New Testament speak quite a bit to the Nicolaitans who had this uh, wrong view. And so it was like a, like a, a false apostle who was lying and saying what the gospel meant and what grace meant and that what eternal life meant and was falsely representing what Christ was looking for. And the scriptures reveal that Jesus says that he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He hates their unrestrained indulgence. He hates their teaching and reaching out to others to do so. The scriptures say, he who has an ear to hear, we must always remember that the church may die, your church may die, as Jesus warns in this passage. Repent unless I remove your candlestick. It's a warning that the, he's not going to support the church or a church, even though it does wrong. This has already been presented to us with Israel when they came into the promised land. Just because God gave them the promised land and he worked mighty miracles for that to happen didn't mean that he would turn a blind eye to their sin forever. And likewise, by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, by the resurrection of a pioneer of your church from the dead, their death, their walking, living death, and by the miracles of their journey along the way, the church where you're meeting in miraculously exists. And yet Jesus will not support that church it doesn't mean the church won't continue to exist, but he's not obligated to support the church in any way if it departs from him. However, each individual in such a church can still live in the case of the Ephesians according to their first love, to be in love with Jesus and to continue to do those things which Jesus loves. And the blessing that he revealed to the Ephesians was the blessing that we all are to partake of the tree of life. That every person who overcomes and continues to serve the Lord throughout their life will be a recipient of access to the tree of life. That is a blessing revealed to us in Revelation. And so I'm going to proceed here quickly to go through some of the, the matters of the other church. Quite quickly, I haven't got time to elaborate, but to, mind you, I may fall into elaboration and then it will be a long session. Let's exercise discipline. The second church is Smyrna and that church name means myrrh, which is uh, involved in uh, the, the rites of death and is a a word that is associated with suffering and persecution. And that's exactly what they lived through in the time of the Caesars, as I pointed out. And the revelation of Jesus was he is the first and last who came to life, that he understands the beginning and the end of their suffering and is their life. He came to life, they also can come to life. And Jesus' plan is that despite the trials as they had among the Caesars and anybody may have in any part of the world, then they are being enriched as they work their way through those trials and he has them. He pointed out that they are to be faithful and fearless for all of their life, that we are all to be faithful and fearless no matter what happens. We are to be assured that God is with us. He has not forsaken us. That even if we die, yet shall we live. He is the resurrection and the life. It does not mean that I won't die. It does not mean that I can't be hurt. It does not mean that I cannot be killed. It means 
that I have eternal life no matter what happens. And I yet may be spared in any of those things. And his blessing he reveals to us in all of that is that we have as Christians the crown of life as we faithfully and fearlessly serve him all of our life. As we are Christians at the end of our life and we have served him. And I'll summarize all of the things that Jesus is looking for at the end of this section. But a crown of life is a blessing that he reveals to us. Pergamum. Pergamon's name means adulterous. What a horrible name to have. And Jesus revealed himself as a two-edged sword. And Jesus' plan was that despite the fact that the church had become adulterous with Constantine, you may remember I mentioned about, uh, then his instruction to the individual believers and the people was to continue with good works despite the fact that you're amongst the very throne of Satan. You know, there's a saying that if you're going to have breakfast with the devil, take a long spoon. Well, this is what he's saying. You're right in Satan's seat. Continue to work despite that. And so the problem he mentions is, is Balaam. Balaam and the Nicolaitans again. That God or the devil is acting like Balaam who deceived the children of Israel to cause them to be adulterous and so lose favor with God. That's what their plan was in the wilderness. And the Nicolaitans were actually a fulfillment of that. They were enabling that to happen from the inside. So they looked like a fifth column eating away at the morality of the people of God and eating away at their strength. It's like the slop from the breakfast bowl of the devil splashing about in the church. His instruction was to repent or Jesus will be against the church. He says, I'll be fighting against you. So if your local church is a church, an immoral church and believes in immorality and supports immorality and supports aligning itself with whatever a government may say just because they're the government. Then Jesus says, you will find yourself fighting against me, he says. So every person is still able to overcome in that environment. Just because the church leadership does that or certain churches or movements do that, it doesn't mean that you as an individual have to agree with that. And you can continue to serve the Lord. And his promise is the hidden manna. The hidden manna and a new name that we all shall receive. And I again emphasize perhaps a little bit more clearly that all of these revelations are coming out of a little story that he's telling. They are wheels within wheels. There's a He's using all of the churches as a prophecy within the things that are. He's using it as a correction that churches may take on board. But he's also using it as a vessel to show us what his will is for us. To show us what we can do if we find ourselves in a similar situation. To reveal to us all of his attributes. Like this one, he is like the two-edged sword. He has a two-edged sword that he knows exactly what's going on. He knows our mind. He knows our thoughts. A discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. A revelation of Jesus. So we get a greater and greater revelation of Jesus through these passages. But we also get a greater and greater revelations of the blessings that he's prepared for us. He hasn't prepared this blessing for me and that blessing for you. He's prepared all of these blessings for all of us. And he's using these stories to reveal them to us, even as they are so important to the individuals at the time or anybody who may find themselves in this situation. The next one is Thyatira, which means daughter. And Jesus is revealed as the son of God in brilliance and also seeing the minds of men. And Jesus' plan 
is that we continue to work and to love and, and express faith with patience, that we keep moving forward. You'll remember that this period of time was when the, the palpal system came in and Mariology and uh, the word Jezebel was mentioned and it involved an immorality. It may well have involved a physical immorality, but it's a spiritual immorality that is spoken about. And if I had time, I could go to all the things that were introduced into the church during this era. The veneration of saints, the uh, paying money for sins, the all of the ideas of icon iconology and uh, uh, confessionals and all sorts of things, putting mediators between man and God, the infallibility of the leaders of the church and so on. The instruction was to hold fast, to hold fast. Those that didn't get into those things, then just to hold fast. And the revelation he brought out was that he would grant us that Christ's will for the church, for you and I as believers, is to have power over nations in the new heaven and the new earth, no doubt. And something to do with granting us the morning star. I have no idea what that means. I have not yet researched that statement, but to be granted the morning star. The morning star is the last star left shining, and if it was the evening star, it's the first star that comes out. It's the brightest star, as it were. And so it is though he is making us the brightest stars, that the church will be the brightest star of heaven one day. Sardis means remnant. Jesus is revealed as having the seven spirits and the seven stars of God. The remnant is the beginning of the Reformation. The ones that held fast the remnant after the devastating work of the Dark Ages. And as they began to separate uh, in the Reformation from the palpal system, uh, then they were a remnant. And this problem was that though they had separated, they had established an, a name for themselves, for example, the Church of England or uh, the Lutheran Church, for, for example, and separated yourself from the palpal system. But that doesn't mean you've come alive in the Spirit of God and instantly you go about uh, doing everything perfectly. Even uh, these places were burning people at the stake, would you believe? Like, you know, I stammer, I literally. I just, you know, I just stagger at it to, to think that uh, church organizations were involved in such things. But they are... They are not recognized by Christ, the individuals that pursued those things as Christians. Like you know, we know Christians. You have to understand that the, the church contains the church. That not everything that is in what we think of as the church is the church. The things that are done in the name of the church are not all done in the name of God. We understand that. But, that all, but it also means that they're not all done in the name of the true church. That Jesus knows those who are his. That we can have a field of wheat and yet there's weeds growing there. And he can say, look, the, the field is ripe for harvest. Beautiful harvest. And so the focus is on the wheat, not on the, not on the weeds. And it is like that for us. There was a lot of weeds out there at the end of the, of the dark ages. And he's, the instruction for them was to remember the gospel. So the gospel had died. Remember the gospel. Repent and watch. Watch for the move of God. Watch for what God is doing. And the revelation for all of us that's prepared, white garments, to be clothed in white, to be having our names written in the Lamb's book of life, and that great day where our name will be named before the Father and all of his angels, what a day that will be. He says that if we confess him before men, he will confess us before his Father. If we deny him before men, he will deny us 
before our Father. That's all we have to do is to be one that confesses the Lord Jesus Christ. Philadelphia means brotherly or brotherly love. Jesus reveals himself as holy and true with the key of David. It's all part of a prophecy that he is descended of David and the rightful heir of the throne of David. And Jesus' plan is that we continue with works uh, for an open door that is set before them as the gospel. And people have much more strength. They have some strength, he says, a little strength. And these people had kept his word. That's his desire for us, to keep his word and keep on persevering. The strength, you can just see the church after we come out of the dark ages and we enter the great evangel evangelical, evangelical age, beginning to gather spirit steam like a like an engine going down a slope you know ch -ch -ch. it's gathering its pace and it's going faster and faster and how they blazed across the world how they blazed across the world from from china to africa to the americas then the gospel went out with a with amazing fervor in that time and the church just came alive with the love of god as it were and the love for fellow man to be able to uh, put the gospel out there in this age, it was not about power, but it was about the salvation of the lost to put the, the gospel out there. In the dark ages, married to the, to the state in every place, it was about power. But in the gospel age, it's about love and reaching the lost for Christ. And he says, hold fast, hold fast. You're on, right, on the right track. Hold fast. Keep doing what you're doing. And one of the things that we all look forward to is becoming a permanent feature this is what it talks about when it's i haven't got time to uh, go into all of the words but a temple or a pit in the temple a pillar in the house of god where you will not be wandering or go out anymore in other words we're permanently part of god's household and look at this that he said uh, he is going to put the name of god on us the name of the new Jerusalem is on us. And the Jesus' new name will also be on us. So we have a new name. And people know us by the name of God, by the name of the new Jerusalem, and by Jesus' new name, which is not revealed uh, in this passage of Scripture. And lastly, Laodicea, which puts us into the modern era since the 1900s, according to uh, the views of some, uh, then the meaning of the name is judgment or, or rule, of, rule of the people. And it's interesting that the, the judgment seat of Christ would come after uh, the, the church age. And Jesus reveals himself as the amen, the faithful and the true, the beginning of God's creation. And Jesus' plan, if you read the passage of Scripture, is that he wants us to be hot, and what happened in the 1900s? What happened? What happened? Don't you know? What happened in the 1900s? But the Holy Spirit began to be poured out in much more abundance. And we have the Pentecostal age as we now know it. Where people have the opportunity to be hot, to be on fire, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire, to be hot, to be uh, alive for him. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. And all you have to do is to pray in your prayer language and look to follow the Lord. And you will be hot. He will be fanning the flames of your life and you will be hot. And so we have these uh, two extremes happening in the world where people are hot and where people are cold that never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But then we have people in the middle that he talks about people that have become lukewarm that own lots of stuff maybe have become rich and powerful in a way but he says that they are poor and wretched and naked because it's all about being clothed with the holy spirit and so his instruction is to open your eyes and to be zealous it's pretty hard to be zealous without being filled with the holy spirit is it so he's to be zealous, to repent, to realize 
that it's not just about being comfortable. It's not just about having a, a nice church and nice fellowship, but to extend the kingdom of God and to be about the mission that began to happen under the Philadelphia age, to press home the gospel wherever we can and to be involved in local and even overseas mission at whatever level we can as a church and even individually. And the revelation that he brings about is that he is offering us deep fellowship. But as we open the door to him, he will sup with us. We'll be seated. It'll be like having a meal together. It'll be intimate. And that even that we'll be seated in his throne. And these are the promises of God to us. And so we see an overall view of the things that he is promising to us. We see the revelations of Jesus in the title column, Jesus' title column, all the beautiful attributes of Jesus, the one who holds us and walks among us, the one who is first and last, who came to life, the one who has a two-edged sword that knows us all together. The Son of God in all his brilliance that sees even our thoughts and our intents. Who has the very seven spirits of God and the stars of God in his hand. Who is holy and true and the true heir of the throne of David. Who is the Amen, the faithful and true. The beginning of the creation as we are in the new creation of God. And that he's full of blessings to give us in the church the access to the tree of life, the crown of life, a hidden manner and our own new name and to have power over the nations and to be like the bright morning star, to wear the white garb of the, of the people of God with our name in the book of life, named before God and all of heaven. And not only that, but to be there permanently in the house of God and to carry the name of God, the name of the new Jerusalem and the name of Jesus himself, his new name. And to proceed with deep fellowship and to be seated in the throne of God. What blessings are revealed in the book of Revelation for us? What blessings does he want us to know? Jesus also voices his will for our life. Now, the way it was worded was quite uh, interlaced and bringing out the blessings of, what, of knowing his will. I'm struck by the simplicity of his will for us. To love him as at the first and keep doing those things as well as the other things that we go on to. To remember those things that we do for Jesus in the simplicity of of being a new believer and to have faith and strength which is grace God's grace working through our lives to, to hear him say something to us and to believe for the strength to do what he's leading us to do to have a focus on the gospel and mission that is outreaching that we're always looking at whether we can influence somebody for Christ it doesn't mean necessarily ramming the Bible as the common vernacular is down somebody's throat but it means having an active heart to reach out to people and to continue in good works which is to also to love and to outreach uh, to our neighbour or to anybody and to continue in moral strength that we maintain our dignity as the children of the living God and we don't follow the Doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which says that you can do anything and, and still be pleasing to God, That's, which Jesus said he hates that. But to maintain our moral strength as God allows and to maintain a biblical understanding and biblical teaching, not to have itching ears to run after strange things, to, but to understand what Jesus is really saying to us through the Scriptures. This is not a hard thing. These are not hard things uh, through our Bibles uh, studies and our, our churches and to be persevering no matter what others are doing or the persecution that may happen to continue in these things to not lose sight of these things 
the blessing here is knowing how simple and achievable his will is. It's not complicated, saints. He's laid it out for us in Revelation. This is Revelation so that you can be blessed, so that you can know what he wants. And none of this is unachievable for the least of us. These are all simple life things that he's interested in. He does not say that we must do some strange pilgrimage and crawl there on our knees. He's not saying that we have to do some great Herculean task to be acceptable to God. If he speaks to us specifically, then it would come under the category of faith and strength. But he is not required of us to invent some great thing to do that he is not giving us strength to do. There is not some strange thing. But the greatest blessing of all is that we can be resurrected with Jesus to live eternally with him. And we can begin to get a sense of it in Revelations chapter 4, verse 1, as I spoke about last time. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. One day we will all hear those words, Come up here. Come up here. Whether you're walking on the earth or whether you're lying asleep in your grave, come up here, come up, and we'll be drawn up into the presence of God. There's a story in Revelation chapter 11 about uh, two witnesses that died and were laid. They left them laying in the street for three days. And after three days, the Spirit of God breathed into them and they stood on their feet. And this is what it says in verse 12 of chapter 11. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies saw them. Wow. What a miracle. Are you ready for a miracle? Because the same miracle is promised to you and I. Let's read about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Where have we heard that before? Strange all this shouting. Shouting seems to become before ascending or something like that. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, once again, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The words of Revelation are given to us for a blessing. That we should know that he has a great plan that he's working out to bring about a new heaven and a new earth. And we may sometimes get confused about what our part in the plan is. And Jesus has made it very simple. The things that he's looking for us, no matter what the age is, that we're living in or the things that we're going through. And he gives us this promise that whether we're dead or whether we're still alive at the time, he's got us. He's got us. And if we are truly his, we will rise and we will ever be with him. And you could begin this journey today. I don't know all the people that are listening to this message. I don't know if you persevered to the end of this message. I don't know if you know the Lord Jesus. I don't know if you feel secure. If 
you have an understanding that if you were to die today, that when this time came that is spoken about in these verses, that you would rise. Or if this time came and you were going about your business, that you would not be left behind. I don't know if you know that. But I can tell you that you can know that. Because the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall not be put to shame. That whoever confesses with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever confesses the Lord Jesus Christ and believes in the heart that God has raised him from the dead because he's going to raise you from the dead, right? If he didn't rise from the dead, you can't rise from the dead. You shall be saved. Can you do that today? Can you do that now? Can you reach that point in the light of all of these promises? of this big plan that Jesus revealed to us. And you can see with your own understanding that it is playing out exactly as he said. Can you see that it must also be true that he wants you to be with him? He is growing, going to great lengths to make sure that we understand that he wants us to be part of the new heaven and the new earth. Are you ready to move into eternity? Are you ready to move with God into the kingdom of God? Are you ready to acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you are ready, the time has come to confess him as your Lord and Saviour. To decide that henceforth I'm a believer. You know, everybody makes a decision for anything that they believe. You hear a bit of evidence. Some people need a lot of evidence to believe something. Some people need a little bit of evidence. But regardless, a moment comes when a person decides to believe. And from that moment on, they're a believer. So I'm asking you. Indeed, I'm telling you that if you can confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour, and decide that you believe that Jesus is real, that God is real, that he rose from the dead, then you also will rise. In newness of life, now you'll experience a new life beginning right now. But you will also rise in that day. Jesus in another place promises that a man, even though he dies, yet shall he live because he's a believer. Let's pray. And you believe right along with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all the promises that you have made. Lord, I thank you that though you have a great cosmic program going on, you have a focus on human beings and that you don't want anyone to perish. But even now I ask that you look upon me. Jesus, I call you my Lord. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe 
that you will raise me up at the last day. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you can raise me up. I give my life to you. As you're my Lord, I ask you to begin to lead me and guide me throughout my remaining life on earth. Show me how to live in these simple things and to live a life of faith and excitement in you. Lord, I give my life to you. Amen. Amen, and God bless you, everyone out there. I trust that God has blessed you uh, with this message, and I look forward to be bringing more blessings out of the book of Revelation next time. God bless, have a fantastic week, and tell somebody about the amazing promises of God. Amen? God bless.